election. I'll look back at that. I must never forget, never forget the conditions under which so many of my constituents still live. And I uh, like to think that my constituents are not just those who live within the boundaries of Winnipeg North Center, but they are pensioners and veterans and people in need right across Canada. And I feel I must not forget them. Stanley Knowles never forgot his constituents. For 38 years as an opposition member of Parliament, he fought persistently to improve the lives of the poor and the elderly. Knowles nagged and prodded and shamed every government since Mackenzie King's until such programs as the Old Age Pension Plan and Medicare were enacted. In 1984, Knowles announced that because of his health, he would not seek re-election. Great Honourable the Prime Minister, it gives me great pleasure, Mr. Speaker, to move that this House, desiring to rec record its deep appreciation of the distinguished and faithful service to Parliament and to Canada, of the Honourable Stanley Knowles, PCBA, BDLLD, designate him effective upon his retirement from his membership in this House, an honorary officer of the House of Commons, with an entree to the chamber and a seat at the table. Stanley Howard Knowles, once described as pure Canadian Gothic, started out life an American citizen. He was born in Los Angeles in 1908. His father, a Nova Scotia machinist, and his mother, the daughter of a New Brunswick servant woman, had emigrated to California in 1904, seeking a better life. Knowles grew up listening to his parents reminisce about Canada. Tales of that vast country to the north fascinated him. So in uh, 1924, when I was 16, I started a bit of traveling. I went from Los Angeles to the northern part and then took the train across Canada. But one of the main parts of it was that I stopped at Carberry, Manitoba, there where I had an aunt and uncle and, and the members of that family. For the city boy from Los Angeles, life on the Canadian prairies was an adventure. And believe it or not, I was so impressed with the place that I just felt I'd, I'd like to be there. Knowles decided to remain in Canada. In September 1927, he enrolled at Brandon College a small Baptist institution located nearby. His ties with his alma mater have continued over the years. I hope I've got this the right way for you. He has been chancellor of Brandon since 1970. Which way does this go? Where does the tassel go? I'm uncertain about that. On the left. That looks good. That looks good. <laughs> to all of you, I say this is a very happy experience that we're doing here tonight, and I wish you the very best. Brandon College marked a turning point in Noel's life. He had arrived at Brandon steeped in Christian fundamentalism. Both he and his younger brother had been raised in a Methodist home. The church was at the center of the family's social life. He had a missionary aunt in India, and Knowles seriously considered a similar vocation. At Brandon, his religious fundamentalism was challenged by progressive teachers who interpreted the Christian Gospels as a call to social reform. 
a fellow classmate, was the late Tommy Douglas, former leader of the New Democratic Party. Totally different types of personalities. I'm sure he thought I was pretty lightheaded and, and spent too much time having fun and making jokes. And uh, I tend to think he was getting to be a bit stodgy for a, for a student. Uh, but uh, the fact is that we, we had a great liking and admiration for each other. Brandon College made a great contribution to Stanley's life because being a small college, they had to be able to do everything. Stanley Knowles, the academic, soon found himself pressed into a production of Daddy Longlegs in the role of the butler. And when cheerleaders were needed, Knowles was out on the playing field. Oh, yes, he was a cheerleader. I can remember him out leading the cheering and so on. And uh, I can't say that he was graceful, you know, <laughs> in waving his arms. But he was certainly effective, and he got other people, other people taking part. Nice to see you, and to wish you the very best. Congratulations. By the end of that three-year experience of being in Brandon College, my religious approach to change from the fundamentalist type to a, a modern approach and to a concern about social conditions. When Knowles graduated in 1930, the world was in the grip of the Great Depression. Soon, nearly one-third of Canada's workforce would be unemployed. What he witnessed reinforced his determination to work for social and economic reform. In the 1930s, life in this country was a terrible thing. People who had nothing, the suffering, the lack of work, the lack of, lack of homes, lack of food. There were lots of old people in those days that didn't have anything, and they, therefore they didn't have any money for car fares to go anywhere, couldn't afford clothes for anything. Poor was too poor. In the hardships that people had to endure, Stanley Knowles was reminded of his own parents' lives. His mother had been born into domestic service. She married in 1904 and lost two infant daughters before Knowles' birth. Throughout her life, her health remained poor. But in uh, April 1919, actually on April the 2nd of 1919, she was making a fire in a stove, uh, lighting some wood, and it smoked a bit and it choked her. In the process of it, uh, she brought up blood. She was told she had tuberculosis, but there was no money for treatment at a sanatorium. Two months after her diagnosis, Margaret Murdoch Knowles died. She was 38. And I was just about 11. I remember, of course, it very well. She'd been a very important person to me. It was an awful blow to go through. But I, there she's 65 years more since she died away, but she's still a very important person to me. The death of his mother drew Knowles and his father closer together. Even when Knowles moved to Canada, the bonds between them remained strong. They wrote to each other every week. And in one such letter, his father commented, I note how your soul is burning with the vision and zeal of youth to carry the message of good news that will make this earth a better place. Like his father, Knowles believed that the church could be a force for reform. After graduation from Brandon, he enrolled at United College, a Winnipeg theological school. One September morning in 1932, Knowles received a letter from his father. He wept at the news. After 24 years of service to the Los Angeles Street Railway, his father had been dismissed. There was no unemployment insurance and no pension plan. The depression had claimed another worker. Obvious right then that the message I would have to preach would be largely about economic conditions. That this, what my father had suffered was just too much. Historian a... Susan Mann uh, And that seems to be the thing that kept him going, that everywhere that he went in Canada, uh, he would see people that were like his mother and like his father, uh, and he simply wanted to improve their, their conditions. 
Knowles was ordained a United Church minister in 1933 and became pastor of Central United in downtown Winnipeg. He preached the social gospel and its message of building a better world for people here on earth. At the height of the depression, his sermons found a receptive audience. But the board of directors at Central United were less enthusiastic. Reverend Knowles' call for social reform was unsettling. And furthermore, how many souls had he saved? At that time, um, <laughs> uh, people who were interested in religion weren't supposed to be interested in things on earth. They were supposed to be thinking mainly about the next world and, and uh, angels and, uh, and uh, otherworldly spirits. In 1934, Knowles was drawn to a newly formed political movement, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. The CCF was born out of the economic chaos and suffering of the Depression. In 1933, various dissident groups assembled in Regina with a common desire to reform the system. For them, capitalism had failed. Only democratic socialism would bring prosperity and justice. The merger of these diverse groups was brought about in large measure by one man, J.S. Woodsworth a former Methodist minister and a member of parliament for Winnipeg North Centre. He became the CCF's first leader. When Stanley indicated by 35 that he thought politics rather than the church was his, uh, his way of uh, doing good for, for humanity, um, Woodsworth encouraged him. Knowles resigned as minister of Central United and became the CCF candidate to contest the federal riding of Winnipeg South Centre. And I sent that word by letter out to my father down in California, and he was so excited and so pleased that he telephoned me about that to say how pleased he was. And he, of course, was sure that I was going to win. I thought so too, you know. And uh, he'd had some illness, but he had hoped that he would be well enough that he'd come back to Ottawa after the election to see me when I'd take my seat down there. None of this was to happen. Knowles learned that his father was dying of cancer. In mid-campaign, he flew to Los Angeles to see him. It was to be their last meeting. On October 3rd, he received word that his father had died. Eleven days later, Stanley Knowles lost his first election. He was 27 years old. After his defeat, he found work as a minister at a mission located in one of Winnipeg's poorer neighborhoods. Were you around here when I was? You're not. Uh, you're not old oh enough no. for that, didn't, haven't you? No, I guess not. <laughs> That's right. After all, it was uh, when I came here in 19, came here 1935. After that, That's 50 years ago. My goodness gracious. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. We worked at that place. Don't use it at all for anything, eh? No. It's been closed down for quite a while. While at McLean Mission, Knowles met and married Vida Cruikshank, a deaconess and social worker at the mission. They had two children, David and Margaret. Vida Cruikshank Knowles died in 1978. Her surviving sister, Donna Patton, recalls her first encounter with Stanley Knowles. He was a surprise, all right. He was lanky and thin and delighted with himself. He came in very happily and um, stood with his hat on and his rubber still on, much to the family's horror, and uh, proceeded to act as though we should all be delighted to see him. And he had, uh, he had no doubts that he was going to be welcomed. And, um, I think we felt he was a bit uh, oh, ungilded. He was definitely a diamond in the rough, if he was a diamond at all. I think they appreciated one another's values. I remember her telling me that he was an idealist. Uh, she certainly was. In 1941, CCF leader J.S. Woodsworth left Ottawa for Vancouver. 
He stopped briefly in Winnipeg to confer with party associates. He was frail and ill, having suffered two debilitating strokes within the year. It was Stanley Knoll's last encounter with his political mentor. On March 21st, 1942, Woodsworth died. A by-election to fill his seat of Winnipeg North Centre was announced for November. The official CCF candidate would be Stanley Knowles. In the Manitoba Commonwealth, Mrs. Woodsworth wrote, Knowles is the man my husband hoped to see chosen, as he believed Stanley well prepared to carry on his work. That was a tremendous day, that election, November the 30th, 1942. We'd worked very hard at it, had a tremendous campaign. We're hopeful we're going to win. I went back to the uh, committee room where the word would come in. And as I walked into the door, my wife came to the front door, greeting me with excited, to, to tell me that 10 polls had come in and we'd won all 10 of them. So for, for Stanley Knowles, or for anybody, any of us, to follow in Woodsworth's footsteps and run for Woodsworth's constituency, and to get elected to sit in Parliament in Woodsworth's seat, you know, <laughs> that was like uh, getting uh, uh, elected to be a part of the Kingdom of God. In January 1943, Stanley Knowles, the newly elected member of Parliament for Winnipeg North Centre, arrived in Ottawa for the 19th session of Parliament. And of course, he's not Political a journalist Charles Lynch. Uh, I remember him, uh, he, he, we were all younger then, but he was never young. Stanley Knowles was never young. He was, he was 60 years old when he was 20 years old. I think he loved the place from the minute he set foot in it. On February 3rd, 1943, Knowles rose in the Commons to deliver his maiden speech. Referring to his carefully prepared text, he paid homage to J.S. Woodsworth and promised to continue his fight for social justice. Then came the speaker's reprimand. The honorable member cannot be expected to be familiar with the rule which forbids the reading of speeches. I hope no other member will take this as a precedent. Now, I didn't say anything to him. I just said to my friends, well, that settles that. I'll never do that again. Little did the speaker realize what he had done. Stanley Knowles set out to become Parliament's procedural expert. This is a guy who lived by fine print. He was the terror of successive speakers because uh, they could never be sure that he wasn't going to have the precedent or, the, or the, uh, the special reference that would make them look silly. Some of my colleagues and members of other parties as well came to me and asked how long those bells were going to ring. And I said, it's until the whips come in. And a couple of members picked up the, the rule book and said, uh, Stanley, where's the standing order? Well, I said, it's not in the standing orders. It's not there at all. It's in the citations. It's part of the tradition, part of the practices. Knowles' attention to the traditions and practices of the House was not some fussy concern for custom. And yet, Mr. Speaker... Opposition members in particular needed to master the complexities of parliamentary procedure if they wanted their voices to be effectively heard. Interest rates, the things that we've done to meet the needs of the people we represent... Stanley Knowles was seldom silent. When Knowles first took his seat in Parliament, the world was at war. Stanley Knowles was a pacifist, but his pacifism was tempered by events that were unfolding in Europe. He was one of the few voices to condemn the government's inadequate response to the plight of the Jewish people. Standing in the House, Knowles sadly acknowledged this is not a subject of wide interest to the people of this country. With victory over Germany and Japan, the Allies looked to the long-term goal of maintaining world peace. Planning for the first General Assembly of the United Nations took place in London in 1945. Knowles was asked to attend. On a cool autumn morning, the Canadian delegation boarded a converted bomber in Montreal for the long and exhausting flight to England. 
This would be the first of many trips abroad for Knowles. Over the years, he would travel extensively to meet with fellow parliamentarians and labor leaders. I think that later on years, my wife felt it was a pretty heavy strain that I was away so much. Being a member of parliament meant long periods of time in Ottawa, away from his wife and two children in Winnipeg. I think it became a concern to her that she was separated because poverty was such a totally involving issue. Vida's sister, Donna Patton. Of course, he just couldn't stop once he began his mission in the House of Commons. That was everything to him. It was the most important thing in his life. Still is. That house is home. Very few of us would envy Stanley Knowles' monastic life. He lived in and for Parliament. We sometimes suspected that he, he slept on Parliament Hill. At times, Knowles may have slept on Parliament Hill, but most nights found him in the home of Walter and Marjorie Mann, an Ottawa couple with whom he boarded. Back in 1944, the Manns were looking for a way to supplement their income. So then we thought, well, we could rent a room, put the two kids into one room and rent a room. And I remember saying, I can still hear myself saying it, but I wouldn't want somebody who was around all the time. Our first thought was, I wonder if we could get one of these MP fellas because they're only around for a couple of months, and then they're gone. Forty years later, he was still there. <laughs> and it all worked so well that we didn't want to get rid of him, and he didn't want to leave. In fact, he said at one point, I remember, when I had said to him, you don't get much service here, do you? And he said, no, I sure don't. I don't want to move out. But if I ever did, I sure wouldn't <laughs> recommend it to anybody else. Like all effective parliamentarians, Stanley Knowles' concerns are wide-ranging. It takes five pages of small print in the 1980-83 to 83 Index of Commons Debates to list all the items he raised, ranging alphabetically from acid rain pollution to a young offender's bill. That, uh, she was hoping her mother could receive, uh, but most of all, spurred by the memory of his father's fate during the Depression, Knowles argued for better pensions. When Knowles came to Ottawa in 1943, there had been no change in old age pensions since their introduction 16 years earlier. Old people had to prove they were destitute before receiving a monthly pension of $20. Government officials probed into people's lives. They examined their bank accounts and assessed the value of their household belongings. The plan was meager and degrading. And Stanley sets to work at it with a kind of dogged determination that he has. Um, you know, he, he gets hold of a problem and he worries it to death. And tomorrow we'll pass a bill that I've been pleading for every week this year to uh, cut out the delay that some 20,000 widows of veterans were subjected to in the bill that we passed last summer. Now, if I he will say that social change in Canada is very, very slow. I mean, it takes him, one of his pension items is a 25-year battle. Um, but, but he will also say that's the only way you can bring about social change. Start on a problem, worry it to death. Make speeches about it, ask questions about it, present bills in the house about it, uh, nag people about it, on and on and on. And eventually, uh, eventually you get it. In 1952, the Liberal government passed the Old Age Security Act. Now, every Canadian over the age of 70 would receive a monthly pension without submitting to a means test. I think, in fact, I said to him one day after I got involved with seniors myself, that I thought that simple act had done more to change the status of seniors in Canada than anything else in all of our history.
pipeline debate led to an upheaval in Canadian politics and catapulted Stanley Knowles into national prominence. The Liberals had grown complacent after two decades in power. They saw their governing as part of the natural order. The most powerful and arrogant of the Liberal ministers was C.D. Howe. On May 14, 1956, he introduced Bill 298. It included a provision for an $80 million loan to an American company to construct an oil and gas pipeline from Alberta to eastern Canada. The Liberal government at the time was really about to sell out the country to American oil and gas companies. They wanted to get a, a, a loan through Parliament very quickly, therefore using closure. Closure was a rarely used parliamentary device to restrict debate, but never before had a government introduced closure before debate had even started. Knowles was appalled by the Liberals' violation of parliamentary procedure. The opposition could not defeat the government bill, but they could delay it. Housing, trade, and so on. By delaying, the Conservatives and the CCF hoped to alert the public to the dangers facing Canadian democracy. The CCF feels that we have in power at the present time... Because of Stanley Knowles' considerable knowledge of House rules, he became the architect of the opposition's challenge to Bill 298. ...downtrodden Parliament in, in many ways right up to the end. But for, um, oh, a good 10 days, there's a tremendous fracas on the House of Commons. It was, it was the center of, uh, of attraction for the whole city. There were queues around Parliament Hill, people wanting to get into the, into the chamber. And, and as you know, one is not supposed to speak, not supposed to make any noise sitting in the galleries. Well, apparently what was going on was just so horrendous that people in the audience, in the galleries, got angry and frustrated and shouted and yelled, got turfed out, of course. And one of the persons who, who got most angry about that was, was M.J. Colwell himself. I remember her very well. We'd accept in part payments. M.J. Coldwell, the leader of the CCF, was respected by all parties for his dedication and diplomacy. Seven years ago, he read the front and shouted at the speaker. He was just in furious. The names he was trying to, to, uh, to the speaker were just incredible. And I, I confess that I was a little annoyed about it. I, I liked having battles and struggles and so on. But I didn't like being indecent and, uh, and uh, angry and that sort of thing. And Colwell did go, and, and it embarrassed me a little bit, but I stood there to let the whole thing happen. I was in the gallery. Were you there, two mm -hmm. that night? Uh, yes. And uh, we were yelling and booing and all kinds of, everything was in chaos, paper flying around. Um, now that picture of Stanley standing there as the lone, really dignified uh, figure uh, in a house that was literally in a shambles, um, I think was the finest hour of any politician um, because he still was maintaining the dignity of the house. The, the pipeline bill that. passed, but the Liberals had lost all credibility. In the 1957 federal election campaign, a key issue became their abuse of power. But in this instance, closure wasn't moved after a long debate, after a filibuster. It was moved before the debate began. Dictatorship. Dictatorship of the worst sort. John Diefenbaker and the Progressive Conservative Party won the 57 election, ending 22 years of liberal rule. Honor our pledges and give you, to the best of our ability, good government. And one of the things that I thought I would do would walk across and see Diefenbaker and congratulate him, whether I thought it or not, congratulate him on being elected. The new prime minister welcomed him warmly and to Noel's surprise, offered him the position of speaker in the forthcoming parliament. No, I didn't tell him, yet what was already in my mind, the answer would be no all through. I couldn't see any way to it at all. But I wanted to be a member of parliament to take part in the real issues facing uh, our party or facing the country. And I felt that if I became the speaker, then that takes me away from it and all of this. I, I just didn't want it at all. I was glad for Stanley's sake he didn't take the job. I don't think his sense of humor is sufficiently honed <laughs> to, to carry him over the rough spots. 
I don't think he would have been as respected as Speaker as he has been by all sides of the House as the, the guru and the, the ultimate authority. Are you ready for the question? Knowles also turned all down suggestions from within the CCF card. to stand for leadership of the party. Opposed? I declare the motion carried. I just felt that other people could do a better job. I was grateful to those who made the proposal to me, but uh, I felt no. Offers of a Senate appointment were also rejected. Knowles, for years, had tried to abolish this unelected upper house. Quite true that I've been trying to get rid of the Senate for a long time. Some members have said to me, uh, shouldn't you give up? You've been trying all these years, and it's still there. At least I can say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, of those who were in the Senate when I first came here, only two of them are still there. So I, I've almost got rid of the Senate as I know it, the trouble is there are too many willing volunteers to go over and take the places of those who, who pass on. It was like Don Quixote, you know, he'd dash at this windmill of the Senate. And he was capable of passion on that issue. Passion. That, that place. He couldn't believe that, that people in a democratic society would tolerate the existence of such an institution. I think a lot of people will scratch their heads and, and say, what was all that fuss about Stanley Knowles about? Well, in Knowles' case, you had to be there for 40 years and get a cumulative idea of how a guy could, could uh, apply himself that assiduously and, and that earnestly to the affairs of his country and of his writing. Knowles' Winnipeg constituency office was managed for many years by Val Coward. He related to the constituency on a personal level, but didn't send literature out constantly. He, he didn't do the or play the the games politicians do. He didn't promise anything he couldn't deliver when Stanley was in. He would always suggest that we have tea. And we'd sit in the office, uh, kitchen at the constituency office and go over records, discuss cases, and make major decisions that ever had anything to do with Winnipeg North Centre or a constituent, sitting, sipping tea at the kitchen table and just having a down-home discussion about how things should go. And it, it always, it certainly was a different way of working, but it was very successful also. The major decisions of your life have come at this table, I think. Yeah. In February 1958, John Diefenbaker called an election seeking a clear-cut majority. For the CCF, prospects looked good. Knowles dared to hope that the party would become the official opposition. It will be a lot better for the Canadian people when Parliament consists, on the one hand, if you will, of an old party representing big business, standing for the old order of things, but on the other hand, a really progressive party, the CCF, representing the workers and farmers of this country, standing for progress and reform, standing for social justice, for all the people of Canada. On March 31st, 1958, as the ballots came in, Knowles was in the constituency office marking up his poll results. The first ballot that came in that night from a poll somewhere, the Tory number was top and I was down. I knew it was an area where we were solid. I could hardly believe it. The voters' verdict was so overwhelming it surprised victors, victims, and voters alike. Not only was CCF leader M.J. Coldwell defeated, but the party standing plummeted from 25 seats to only eight. And down also went the CCF's deputy leader, Stanley Knowles, whom friends and foes alike had considered as one of Canada's most gifted parliamentarians. For Stanley Knowles, Parliament was life. At the age of 50, he found himself looking for another job. After very thorough consideration, I have reported back to those individuals in the Canadian Labour Congress who suggested that my name might be put forward for an executive vice president of the Congress that uh, I am willing that my name be placed in nomination for such a position. Knowles was elected executive vice president of the Canadian Labour Congress and handed a major assignment. 
He was to bring the labor movement and the CCF together to form a new political party. This afternoon, the CCF National Convention passed a historic resolution. Another figure in the formation of the new Democratic Party was Tommy Douglas, an old good friend from Brandon College days. Douglas was now Premier of Saskatchewan and leader of the first Democratic Socialist government in North America. In forming an amalgamation of all workers with hand and brain who are interested in forming a political party to represent the working people of Canada. There's something new that will be added when the new party comes into being is that it will be a party large enough, strong enough, with su sufficient support and sufficient membership that it can become one of the two major parties of this country and eventually the government of Canada. We had the events here, of course. And, and then for the next three years, we worked to form a new party. And we won that battle in 1961. My press people reported that it was the largest political convention that had ever been held. Yes, the one I we had that, that time in 1961. Yeah. On July 31st, 1961, over 2,000 delegates joined Knowles in the Ottawa Coliseum for the founding convention of the NDP. But we successfully got that party going uh, with that new name, the New Democratic Party and we elected people to lead it, and we started the campaign that we, we, we were confident it would do well in the next election. It's strange coming back. Eh? Yeah. In 1962, Diefenbaker set the date for the next election. It would be on June the 18th, Stanley Knowles' 54th birthday. So the women in charge of this had a smart, smart idea. They got birthday cakes and things ready and had decided that if there was a defeat, they wouldn't bring it. But I wanted to handle it. So sure enough, and the next thing over there, they produced these birthday cakes, and we celebrated right there. Knowles was back in Parliament. His four-year exile was over. But the NDP had failed to make the breakthrough he had hoped for. The party had won only 19 seats. Over the years, regardless of the NDP's fortunes, the voters of Winnipeg North Centre continued to return Knowles to the Commons. Now, he worked hard when, at election time. He'd go out at election time, and we all... I've never campaigned with him out there. But we all know about his early mornings and greeting the people at the bus stops and at the plant gates and all this sort of thing, and it just worked and worked and worked and worked. The time I was there, an election in the, in the 70s, there were some liberal candidates trying to do the same thing, shop gating at the door, and they were young men, and they were in muscle shirts, and they were handing out slick, uh, slick stuff, and, you know, they were saying, good morning, have a good shift, and Stanley looked at me and said, have a good shift, and these guys don't want to be here. And, just, and the, the guys would come up to Stanley, they would just, they would just walk right by the other, uh, the other candidates, come up to Stanley, shake his hand, and say, carry on, Stanley, when are you going to get the pension down to 60, Stanley? Thanks for everything you're doing, Stanley. It was just incredible. You miss the place? Oh, I miss it terribly. Yeah, I can imagine, eh? You know, I used to come to this gate 50 what? years ago. There was one place where we could get a crowd outside for lunch sometimes and make speeches outside. What about the old age pensioners? Ten years ago, the pension was $30 a month. According to this liberal pamphlet, that pension would have to be increased by 80% just to keep it where it was. Governments, it is said, learn more from their opponents than from their ardent supporters. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, Stanley Knowles carried on his fight for pension reform. He never let a government rest, and his persistence paid off. By 1970, supplementary pension programs had been introduced, pensions increased, and indexed to the cost of living, and eligibility lowered to the age of 65. In 1973, on his 65th birthday, Knowles himself became a recipient of the old age pension. I have today received assurance from the bureaucracy that your first, well, I hope many, old age security checks will be dispatched to you on this occasion. Not, quote, soon, unquote, but on the date that is due. <laughs>
I personally wish you very many happy returns and all sincerity, C.M. Dury. Thank you. Thank you, Bud. You know, with the series which you started, I thought you were going to announce the removal of the 2% ceiling. <laughs> I believe in being a teaser. Uh, uh, oh, that's coming later. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bud Drury, and thanks to all of you. I mean, for such a dry stick, Stanley certainly does evoke an emotional response uh, in people. Where it comes from, I don't know. A little lonely. He's, uh, he's tall and thin and gangly and kind of moves through the world as if this isn't quite his place. Edmund Burke, the 18th century British philosopher and parliamentarian, once declared, we must be kept in awe of our constituents, or we never shall do our duty as we ought. Mr. Speaker, the wisdom of that mean, remark was never lost on Stanley Knowles. The thrill of being here and winning some of these accomplishments, a feeling that people out there are perhaps a little better off in some respects, or that they're, they're glad they got someone who's a friend at court for them. That makes this experience, the 35 years that I've had here, such a delight that I hope I can do it again. Another 35. Another, another 35, thanks to my honorable, my honorable friend. A few days after his speech, Parliament adjourned for summer recess. When it reconvened in the fall of 1981, Stanley Knowles was not present. The morning of October the 2nd, 81, when Walter said, it's Stanley at his breakfast, I dashed into the kitchen. His porridge pot wasn't there. And if there was some one little thing out of routine in Stanley's life, you knew there was something wrong. So I said, uh-oh, he hasn't had his breakfast. Dashed upstairs. There he was, absolutely out. I knew nothing about it for about two or three days. About the third day afterwards, I realized I was lying in a bed in a hospital room, and I wondered what it was all about. Knowles had suffered a massive cerebral hemorrhage. An operation saved his life, but the stroke had left him severely impaired. Well, some months later, weeks later, when he was in the rehab, and we were invited to see his first speech therapy session, that we realized, he didn't know we were watching, of course, one-way glass, that we realized, A, he couldn't read a word, and B, couldn't understand a word she was saying to him. Knowles will be 74 in June. He was operated on last fall for a blood clot in his brain. He's been taking therapy since then, and now feels ready to leave hospital. How are you feeling? What am I doing? Yeah. A lot better than it was when I came here. I remember taking Stanley uh, up to the house uh, one of the first times after the stroke. Uh, now, he was, I'm sure, uh, concerned uh, about his appearance uh, and so on. He was huddled in the car and, uh, I thought, quite depressed. Uh, I let him out. This was at the back door. <clears throat> a route that I was quite unfamiliar with, but he instantly recognized it. Um, he straightened right up. Uh, he saluted the guard. Um, he magnificently waved me on uh, and led the way through the, all that tunneled maze. Uh, was instantly in control, knew everything was happening. Uh, the elevator and the rest of it said hello uh, to the people. Uh, in the corridors, you know, and up to his room. But again, the, the straightening up of the shoulders, a great sense of pride uh, that he wasn't going to let this thing lick him. I believe the House has said it all. I do want to wish the Honorable Member for Winnipeg North Century a warmest welcome and tell him how much we all love him. Madam Speaker, 
friends, I thank you indeed for your kindness and welcoming me back here after these six months. I can't be here every day because I go back to the hospital every uh, two days a week to try a little bit more about the brain and so on. But uh, as soon as I can, I'll get back. And uh, it means a great deal to me to have the kind of reception you've given me today. Thank you. Thank you. I still dared to hope for the first year and a half of my illness. I was hoping that I'd be well enough I could run again. But after about a year and a half towards two years from, from 1981, I realized it was impossible. Everyone had been sort of treating him very gently, knowing the decision was coming. And he asked me what I thought. And I very boldly, after taking a very deep breath, said, Stanley, You've done your time, it's time to retire. And he kissed me and he said, thank you. He said, that's what I think too, but nobody said it as plainly as you have. And within two days he had announced that he wouldn't seek re-election. In 1984, the government called a federal election. For the first time in 42 years, the CCF NDP candidate for the riding of Winnipeg North Center would not be Stanley Knowles. I think that a good deal of what I was trying to do had actually been given to me very strongly by J.S. Woodworth himself. He had done the job for his 20 years in Parliament. I had done it for 40 years in Parliament. So between the two of us, we kept it going for a good 60 years. But we are learning, nonetheless, with sadness that he will not be running again. In recognition of his service to Canada and his contribution to Parliament, Knowles was made an honorary officer of the Commons. A chair is permanently reserved for him at the Speaker's table. Well, if all I do is just sit here and be part of things, well, it gives me a feeling I'm still part of my Parliament. I'd like people to think of my being there being not just a tribute to me for having been an MP, but I represent the members of Parliament that I've known here for my 40 years, and so I come as often as I can. It means so much to me. When Knowles came to Parliament as a rookie MP in 1943, he ended his maiden speech with a remark that would come to typify the man. I feel, he said, that I have been sent here on serious business. Well, there was only one Stanley Knowles. I've only known one Stanley Knowles. So he's not the last of a breed, he's one of a breed. Now, uh, what, what shall we say? We'll never see his like again? And some people will mop their brow and say, thank God for that. But it was great to have him. It was great to have him one time to keep us honest and remind and be the conscience of a sometimes conscienceless parliament. What was said of the 19th century French socialist Jean Jaurès could well be applied to Stanley Knowles' life and work. He is the authentic socialist, not in doctrine, but in the essence of the idea and the cause. He believes that man is good, that society can be made good, and that the struggle to make it so is to be fought daily, by available means, and within present realities. Those experts on being single, Sarah and Roz, decide it's time Helen got back into circulation. They're going to show her all that's new in dating. After all, it's been 25 years. Sarah, tonight at 9.30, 11 in Newfoundland on most CBC stations.